Good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone to this fifth online session of Singapore Perspectives 2023 work. My name is Christopher Gee, a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. This session is entitled The Changing Role of Unions, and it is fitting that it comes directly after NTUC SecGen, Mr. Ng Chi Meng's session earlier. I'm sure that we, panel five speakers that we have here, and all of you joining online will expand on some of the themes already explored in the earlier session and more besides. Some brief housekeeping rules before I introduce the speakers in this session. Please note that the Singapore Perspectives Conference is open for media coverage. You may type your questions using the Q&A panel on the right hand side of the screen. Please do so at any time during the session. We invite all at our conference to contribute to our discussions in a respectful and safe manner and focus on the issues at hand. IPS reserves the right to act in a way to ensure that this is always the case in all of our chat or Q&A functions on the conference website. The nature of work um, and the characteristics of work workplaces have all changed significantly, underpinned by globalization and deglobalization digitalization and new technologies that have disrupted and propelled wide ranging economic and business transformation. The labor force everywhere is being reshaped to suit this new environment with new modes of working that confound the traditional modes of organization of labor. We'll touch on the trend of the decline in unionization uh, during this panel session. In Singapore, the labor force is similarly impacted by all of these trends that we talked about earlier with the pool of typical union members shrinking. On top of this, we have to consider the fact that the resident labor force here is also aging rapidly. Panel five focuses on the changing role of unions. We'll pose the critical question about the role of the union movement in Singapore's unique tripartite model and how tripartism might be affected by these structural changes. How might the role of unions be redefined given the emergence of the new workforce, new modes of employment and of working? To get us started on our discussion, we have three distinguished speakers on this panel. In their speaking order this morning, we have Mr. Desmond Chu, Assistant Ge Secretary General of the National Trades Union Congress, NTUC, and Executive Secretary at the Union of Telecom Employees, and also an advisor to Young NTUC. Next, we have Associate Professor Irene Ng from the Department of Social Work and the Social Service Research Center at the National University of Singapore, whose research areas are on poverty and inequality, intergenerational mobility, and social welfare policy. We also have Mr. Sim Ging Wan, Executive Director of the Singapore National Employers Federation, and who is also the co-chair of the Tripartite Work Group on Representation for Platform Workers. Their fuller biographies are available on the conference website and in the interest of time, I will kick off the session now. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes, which will leave us a good 45 minutes to have a purposeful discussion about the issues already mentioned. Desmond, would you like to begin? Hi, thanks, Chris. All right, uh, morning, Irene and Kim Guan. And to all conference participants, uh, thank you so much for giving me um, the time and space uh, to share with you on the changing role of unions. Of course, it matters a lot to me because this is um, the job that I spend many hours on. Uh, so today, uh, if I can, uh, let me share with you on uh, three things, how NQC has evolved over the years to tackle workforce changes, the changes of concern today, and the implications of not being able to represent workers effectively, and of course, how NTUC has evolved to better support the needs of the new workforce uh, and to build a, so, a stronger social compact. And of course, um, looking forward to different ideas that NTUC can take on board uh, to better support uh, our workers. Uh, perhaps it's useful on a Monday morning to start to have a, a little trip back to history. Uh, now, this is the picture of the Hockley bus riots. Um, this is also the first introduction that many of us will get uh, to unions, uh, especially when we study uh, social studies in secondary school or your history textbooks. Now, the social, economic, and political context of Singapore in the 1950s and 60s back then was very different. Uh, Singapore back then had very high employment rates, wages were low, education level was low. 
Now, the union movement was born in response to these issues. Poor pay, people cannot find jobs, workers being bullied. Now, the unions were born when there were social injustices, workforce tensions, inequities, and the inability to tackle these issues effectively. Now, of course, when the, the PAP was formed, primarily by unionists and later the ruling government, we have a first sense of what a new compact could be like. Uh, fundamentally, uh, we stopped taking to the streets at every possible opportunity, moved towards a more harmonious and constructive uh, relationship. Really, that was when tripartism uh, has its first roots. Now, in exchange, the workers were promised a job and pay appreciation over time. And as you would see, uh, over the last many decades, this has led to win-win outcomes. So by and large, it has worked. Right? We had almost uninterrupted growth except for a few financial crises. Uh, those were, uh, some were a bit longer, but most, like, uh, most of all, it was short. People understood the roles of unions, the role of government, and the roles of uh, the employers. There was a compact. You give up something in exchange for something else so we can all be better off together. So tripartism has a big role to play in building a compact in helping workers. Over the last six decades, uh, it was this NTUC's compact with the workers of Singapore and with businesses that has helped to facilitate Singapore's economic growth and also um, reinforce the cornerstone of tripartism um, as a nation-building uh, construct. Now, how has things changed? You know, decades since the 1970s, I don't think any one of us want to go back to the Hockley bus riots time. Uh, but the protection of workers against workplace unfairness continues to be central and core. Um, so you can find that uh, as recent as in 2020, um, there's uh, Ego Services Asia, whereby retrenchment was done unfairly, workers was not treated properly. Um, NTUC authorized unions prepare for legal industrial action. Uh, that was in the aircraft maintenance repair and overhaul space. Of course, badly affected during the COVID period time, um, shut down, and therefore workers and businesses were affected. And in 2021, uh, we have our Food, Drinks and Light Workers Union stepping in um, to unionize 12 cupcakes. Many of us are familiar with it, but they did not pay their foreign staff well. They were undermining the system and we will have to come in and step in. So therefore, championing workers' rights continues to be core um, to NTUC's uh, mission. But there are certain things that we needed to evolve um, beyond this core mission, and they're all related to this. Now, first of all, um, was that we need to build new tools to help workers. There were persistent market failures that resulted in lower wage workers getting their wages being rather stagnant and even declining in sectors such as cleaning, security, and landscape as, as of um, 10, 15 years ago. So we conceptualized the progressive wage model in 2012. It was a means to uplift wages, skill levels, and work prospects of workers. Now we've expanded it to sectors such as lift and escalator. You see the the picture here. Uh, for a while, the wages were just stagnant and no Singaporeans want to get into this space. We've also gone into waste management, retail, food services. Now, these new tools, these new national tools were built together with um, businesses and the government. And it has shown that NTUC can listen deeply to people and evolve new tools uh, for nation building. Now, are there certain things that still being called? I mean, this is, this is a bit of advertisement here for my uh, Fair Price people. Uh, but the social mission of moderating cost of living continues to be as relevant to workers today, and perhaps even more so in an inflationary environment. Uh, during COVID, we have to bring in emergency supplies of masks, groceries of all sorts. Today, through Fair Price Food Fair and First Campus, uh, we still help Singaporeans to intervene in grocery food education costs. Uh, these are just some of the discount schemes we do, but the larger role is to moderate cost and help workers to be able to cope uh, in the new environment, especially when it's going to be inflationary for quite some time. Of course, um, I have the benefit of looking at uh, uh, Professor Irene's deck, and you'll find some similarities to this. There are a lot of structural changes that Singapore and the, uh, and the tripartite partners will have to deal with. The landscape of work is very different. Uh, workers' priorities are shifting. More workers value flexibility and freedom, and therefore, we have more self-employed workers especially their gig workers. But the problem is these workers are afforded little protection with limited long-term financial and retirement adequacy. And we're about, two to, we're about 200,000 
of such workers now is something that we need to look at very seriously. Of course, the younger workforce of today is very different, as um, Chris has also alluded to, that priorities have shifted. It's increasingly much better educated compared to just even a generation ago, changing needs and aspirations. So now younger workers now, they want to find work that's more purposeful, that allows them to express their both work and life needs better and also um, help their mental well-being. You also find that um, there's a lot more disruptions now. Disruptions coming from digitization, uh, green transition. And of course, as workers go through different life transitions, there is just greater need. For example, um, the COVID situation showed to us that there's a need to protect workers' employability. So it means leveling playing field for workers so that they can attend training to remain relevant, looking into issues like unemployment support, uh, finding ways for them to be able to upskill such for better jobs, um, and if they do fall out of jobs, is there a better safety net? Now, what are the consequences of us not being able to deal with some of these issues? Um, now, besides, of course, the Hockney bus riots and a lot of strife, you also find that, um, interestingly, in the United States, that as unionization has dropped, uh, wages have also not caught up. There was a distinct difference between the unionized labor force and the ununionized ones. So it does show that uh, the decline might cause problems for us downstream. Of course, the contexts are, are quite different, uh, but it is informative and instructive for us to bear that um, in mind. So we have tried to um, do more um, because if you don't, you look at this platform workers thing and uh, you'll find that there's a greater desire for such workers to organize themselves. It doesn't mean that a freelancers, you don't do anything about it, the, the workers will not come together uh, to do something. We have seen it locally in response to the PMD ban. The workers came together to, to demand for changes. So we need a change in legislation to allow unions associations to represent this group. If not, we're going to get increasing uh, discontent and worse still, uh, we can tear at the fabrics uh, of the Singapore Compact. This social compact problem extends uh, beyond just the gig economy. Uh, there's a very strong likelihood of a two-track economy forming. We run group continue to enjoy growth in wages and uh, in, in their career, um, especially those in tech, those uh, high knowledge base. Another group tends to be older, less educated, see a stagnation over time. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, uh, but Prof Irene has a couple of very good slides on looking at the differences in education level. Um, and the wages it commands. So um, it is a serious issue that we need to look into. Now, this can give rise to growing anxieties and happiness and uh, negative impact on the social fabric. So we have sought to address some of these issues, um, taking this very seriously. Uh, we're championing for the rights of the platform workers, participating in the advisory committee on platform workers, um, trying to get together a set of recommendations, um, giving legislative rights representation, uh, protecting them for workplace injury. We invested, set up a UFSE unit uh, for freelancers because they will need development of new types of support. We have even gone into supporting visual, audio, creative people called VIPA, uh, and our delivery riders. It's in essence, we need to go away from the tradition, evolve from traditional unions to organize ourselves and enter different spaces to look into and provide new products and services um, for the new workforce. Um, of course, uh, Kim Guan would know that um, we worked very hard together on the PME task force. It was something that both parties realized that if we do not address the concerns of the PMEs, then we were going to have downstream problems. And together, we can help them achieve better wages, welfare, and prospects. There was a list of nine recommendations that were submitted. And of course, um, some uh, will be worked on, uh, of course, by the tripartite partners, especially in the protection of uh, PMEs. Um, another space that we we're going to uh, in quite a large way was the training ecosystem at the firm level. Uh, we've always been looking at training as a way to improve productivity, but now we find that uh, we probably need to also work at the firm level. Usually it was at the worker level, a bit more micro, but evolving to company training committees, working with the company, on supporting their, their transformation plans, hoping that by doing so, 
we can foster and catalyze greater changes towards higher productivity work at the workplace. Um, we started, uh, we know that tackling the issues with the younger workforce uh, requires a very deep uh, level of understanding. And of course, it must start with a very genuine, authentic listening. So last year, we started a youth task force. Uh, our aim is to reach out to 10,000 younger people, both within uh, the schools and uh, first or second career younger people to understand the needs that they have. So we have been going to the IHLs, listening to them. Um, uh, we're in the middle of forming uh, recommendations. And we find that such a way of collaboration is important. It shows out a lot of blind spots uh, in the way we offer our products. Uh, and we need to build the next uh, generation of support and partnership um, together uh, with our younger workforce. So um, then, of course, um, we are also now very much into the retirement adequacy. It's a big issue for Singapore as one in four Singaporeans would be um, 65 and above come 2030. Um, very significant challenges and we want to make sure that our people are ready for retirement adequacy. In fact, through our engagement, there's always been something that even younger people are concerned about. So advocating for ample employment support, again, is something that um, NTUC will be going to a fairly big way. Uh, because we know that as, as cycles become shorter, business cycles, there will be greater unemployment anxieties, uh, uncertainty, and we want to make sure that there's a good safety net. Now, where does this all lead us to? Now, in conclusion, the modern day rapidly changing workforce and the dynamics that requires tripartite partners to evolve our thinking and services to stay relevant. Structural changes such as the green transition, tech-driven inequities, changing aspirations of our citizenry it can deeply fracture Singapore's social compact. So I think it will first require our ever deeper understanding of workforce issues, apply ourselves to uh, being on the ground. As you see from the picture here, we have deployed uh, quite a number of NTUC staff uh, to be out on the ground listening to issues day in, day out, uh, weekends and weeknights included, because we need to change our support to workers a, a lot more agile. So NTUC's role, in fact, within the national construct of tripartism um, is perhaps even more critical than ever. And we are a lot more uh, cognizant of the fact that we need to play an even bigger role to preserve and build Singapore's social compact um, together with our tripartite partners. So with this, I will pass my time back to Christopher. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, thank you for sharing how NTUC has changed and is changing in response to new challenges. I'm particularly struck um, by the images that you showed in your presentation about um, um, how NTUC has been engaging uh, with partners and workers. It seems to be quite a very different modus operandi of a union movement, especially when you compare this against um, other places around the world. Certainly in the UK, parts of Europe uh, and the US, they've already been affected by wide ranging strike action uh, this past few months. Um, and action taken into the streets in some cases. But I wonder what you think about this issue that we might take up uh, further um, in the discussion later, whether the, the calmness, the cooperation amongst the tripartite partners means that workers end up feeling that all the decisions are being made at a level that is higher than them, uh, and then they lose the sense of agency and connection with the ultimate policy decisions that are made. Um, we'll come back to that later, I think. Um, let's pass the floor now to Irene, uh, who will speak about this issue from a different perspective. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, IPS, for inviting me to speak at your flagship conference. Uh, what an honour, and what an honour also to speak on the same panel as Mr. Chu and Mr. Sim. Uh, next, please. Next, please. This is what I'll share. Um, I'll start by um, talking about Singapore's tripartite system in global context, and I'll share some insights from my research study on in-work poverty among the young before I discuss the role of unions. Yeah, I realize what I'll share um, overlaps with what Secretary General Ng Chi Ming has spoken about this morning as well as uh, what Mr. Chu has said, um, but I think it's worth repeating to lend collective voice to workers. Next, please. Every December, we'll see headlines like this of transport workers going on strike in Western economies. They target the Christmas period when they will create the greatest hardship when throngs of people are traveling to be with loved ones. 
such as the operating principle of Western labor unions. Collective bargaining in these societies tend to take a confrontational approach to disrupt as much as possible so that businesses feel the pain and it's more likely to give in to the wage demands. Next please. In Singapore, we've largely avoided such disruptions because of our conciliatory tripartite system, um, where government, employers, and labor union negotiate wages in collaborative process. And the emphasis of Singapore's tripartite system is different. Next, please. Chiu Sun Bing and Rosalind Chu have noted that our model maximizes employment in contrast to unions in Western societies which aim to maximize wages. The advantages of employment maximization through a conciliatory approach includes low unemployment, minimal industrial disruption, and a favorable business environment. However, it has disadvantages, in particular, poorer wages and job conditions. Next, please. Indeed, through my research, I have found the following structural challenges. We are in an era of high income and wealth inequality all over the world, but inequality in Singapore is comparatively higher. And while inequality has improved in Singapore in the last decade, with COVID-19 now, low-income workers have been economically more adversely affected. And with this, the problem of inequality has become even more challenging to tackle. I've also estimated that low-wage incidence in Singapore is higher than those in OECD economies. Lastly, the structure of work itself is changing. There are more non-standard forms of work today, including self-employment and platform work. At the same time, we're facing cyclical headwinds. Next, please. With an impending global recession, the highest inflation rates in decades, and unemployment rates that are still low but rising. Which challenges do we prioritize, the cyclical or the structural? If we focus on the cyclical challenges in order to save businesses and jobs, then we might set aside or slow down policies to address the structural challenges. And this was what happened in the 1980s when we stopped wage restructuring due to recession. Some people have um, linked the persisting wage stagnation of lower educated workers to that U-turn in wage restructuring in the 1980s. Next, please. So the tripartite system is constantly balancing the tensions of employment maximization versus wage maximization, of business interests versus worker interests. And in today's labor market where PMETs outnumber non-PMETs, another tension is whether to prioritize PMETs and non-PMETs. At this point, let me share some findings from my research as a voice on behalf of young non-PMETs. Next, please. I'll share from my research on workers who are aged 21 to 38 from a survey we conducted in 2020 and 21. Our target research subjects were low income and low educated young people, but for comparison, we also surveyed higher income and higher educated respondents. Next, please. First, we found a high wage premium for degree holders, where respondents with a degree or above qualification earns $1,600 uh, $1, uh, per month more than a diploma holder. In contrast, there was no wage premium of an ITE certificate where the ITE graduate earns on average $2,000 a month, no different from respondents whose highest qualification was secondary and below. And part of the reason is that many ITE graduates take the same types of jobs as those with lower education. This is shown in the chart in the next slide. This chart shows occupational distribution by education with the lowest education of secondary and below on the left followed by ITE, then diploma, and then degree and above. And then the last column with a black outline is the overall distribution. I want to highlight two things. Um, first is the overlap between the type of jobs held by workers with ITE and those with secondary and below qualifications. Um, the second is to highlight the high prevalence of lower educated young people in the low wage sectors um, that the progressive wage model targets. So we look specifically at the first two columns on the left. Next, please. Here are the numbers. More than 20% of ITE graduates and below are in services and sales. Next, more than 15% are plant and machine operators, of which the majority are self-employed platform workers. Next, and contrary to the belief that young Singaporeans are not in the lower skilled jobs of cleaners and laborers, 5% of IT graduates and 12% of respondents with secondary and below education are cleaners and laborers. 
So if we think about the future of the labor movement and NTUC is trying to reach young labor market entrants, we need to pay attention to these lower educated young people in low skilled jobs. They are the minority, but very vulnerable. So I was heartened to hear Secretary General talk about the examples of career ladders being built for um, graduates um, from IT, for example. But it, it seems like that's still um, in the initial stage and looking at the numbers from my research, we, I really hope that kind of initiative can take off. Next, please. Uh, one important avenue for lower educated workers to better their earnings is through training. Unfortunately, we found that lower educated respondents are less likely to attend training and attend employer-sponsored training. And you can see these in the charts on the slide, um, where as you increase the education level, the um, training rates also increase. Employer-sponsored training form the bulk of training received by respondents, so who employers prioritize is very key. Evidently, they prioritize those with higher education. Next, please. Our finding corroborates with those by Young and others published in the inaugural Singapore Labour Journal by NTUC. Several panelists at the Labour Research Conference held in October last year also highlighted this finding which is that employers prioritize high potential workers for training rather than those in most need of training. As you can see from this table, almost half of employers prioritize high potential workers. And this uh, percentage is more than twice the next highest of workers with skills gaps. So while we have a national emphasis on training, unequal training participation could instead worsen inequalities in human capital and social mobility. Employer-sponsored training and time off to attend training is all the more important for lower educated young people in lower skilled jobs. Instead of investing in the ones who can already run fast, thus enabling them to run faster and leaving those who cannot run as fast behind, why not invest in the undertapped potential of lower educated young people? If the lack of education or outstanding performance at work is due to the lack of opportunities and not just individual failings, then the marginal value, the marginal productivity of investing in lower educated young people is high. Next, please. But training is only one of many solutions. Because low-skilled wages have experienced decades of stagnation, we need to correct wages. As DPM Lawrence Wong has said, we need to value heart and hands-on work. And we need to also value beyond the degree certificate. For example, um, in my research, we interviewed a couple of respondents who had diploma or IT certificates and they were working in administrative positions. They shared that it's very hard for them to have further salary increases or be promoted simply because they don't have a degree. And in correcting wages, while wage increases need to commensurate with productivity improvements, we should be looking at organizational or industry level productivity instead of individual productivity. For example, in the hard work of a childcare assistant or a patient service associate, how much more productive can you get answering questions at the counter or taking care of children? And for hands-on work, the next slide showing one news feature in the Straits Times illustrates which correction. Simply by being changed from a daily wage to a monthly waged worker, Mrs. Tan, the worker in this picture, now receives $2,000 a month in salary, twice that of her salary as a daily waged worker when she earned $1,000 a month. And she now receives benefits too. Did her productivity improve? No. The discontinuation of the daily wage scheme is to me a good illustration of wage correction that NTUC can continue to champion. The article cited Mr. Lim Chi On, former Secretary General of NTUC, as calling the scheme colonial and ancient. Yet the article also mentions how NTUC has found it hard to continue representing a dwindling group of workers. And one reason for their dwindling numbers is that formerly waged, daily waged workers upgraded their skills and moved on to higher paying jobs. But, you know, looking at the uh, occupation group overall, we cannot rely on upskilling beyond such jobs alone as a means to improve wages. We still no need workers in these jobs, cleaners, refuse collectors, gardeners, and also other underpaid occupations such as childcare assistants, plumbers, um, which in Singapore has become largely filled by migrant workers. And here's another challenge for the labor movement in Singapore. 
Um, in countries such as Canada, unions have expanded to also represent migrant workers. And perhaps this is one question I pose, um, which is to what extent can NTUC um, represent migrant workers in part of its core representation? Overall, whilst upskilling is one important route to better wages, we must continue to level up wages of bottom earners, and this might not commensurate with individual productivity. Next, please. In fact, um, there is circularity in the relationship between productivity and wages. While we emphasize the need to improve productivity to receive higher wages, there are three possible theories suggesting that increasing wages can improve productivity. First, increasing wages compels businesses to innovate. And this is what I found when I did research on the reactions to the progressive wage model for cleaners. Employers that I interviewed shared with me how, oh, now that they have to pay the uh, workers more, you know, they start to change their bis uh, business model and innovate. So productivity at the business level. Secondly, uh, according to efficiency wage theory, increasing wages can increase worker effort and loyalty. And finally, poverty research has shown that poverty impairs functions. So if we increase the wages of low-wage workers, we can improve their functioning at work. Next, please. I've said much about low-wage workers who need union representation, but the reality is that the numbers are not as many today. Right? This pie chart shows the rough distribution of the current labour force by age group and status. You can see that PMETs, which are the top half, right, um, more than non-PMETs, and then the yellow portion, which is the older workers, there's the older workers more than the younger workers. So if we look at young non-PMETs, there's only that little pie um, sliver, right, which is about 10% of the labor force. Um, and um, next, please. If we look at even those who are self-employed and those are don't come under the employment act right now, they're, they're an even smaller group of which the gate economy is um, from a large proportion. Next, and we see the evolution of unions, right? It started off as trade unions representing the trades, then with the industrial value, uh, revolution representing industrial workers. And today, as PMETs become the majority of the labor force, the focus is shifting to them. PMETs are vulnerable too, um, subject to job displacement and they need skills upgrading. But the most vulnerable workers who need representation are still the low-skilled workers, but their numbers are dwindling. Looking at the future workforce, I think about 20% will stop with an IT certificate and fewer than 10% will have even an IT certificate, but they will be in the PWM jobs. If we don't narrow the wage and conditions of these jobs now, if we don't deal with the structural inequalities today, we're kicking the problem down the road and the future generations will suffer the consequences. Next, please. So even though we're facing very challenging economic times, I hope the tripartite partners will push ahead to address the structural challenges, speed up and expand PWM. The government is pairing wage increases with wage credits for businesses anyway. As future jobs become less employment-based, employment -based, think ahead to include the self-employed into labor laws and protection, and then find other ways to cut costs and not wages. Given the wide income inequality, can employers and top executives absorb more personal wage cuts or reductions in wage increases so as to retain the jobs of the lowest wage earners and enable them to keep up with the cost of living? Next. So let's keep strengthening collective bargaining towards wages, workers, and non pmets Thank you. Thank you, Irene, uh, for your, what I believe uh, prov are provocative points about the balance of priorities between employment or wage maximization, uh, between the business interests and worker interests, as well as uh, the different groups of workers. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to these matters uh, later on in the discussion. I have the questions. Uh, so if the audience have questions or, answer, or comments to be made uh, already, please uh, put them in the Q and A panel. I think we've already got a few. Can I now please ask uh, Ging Guan to make your presentation? Thank you, Chris, and good morning to uh, my fellow panelists, uh, Brother Desmond, as well as Associate Professor Irene, and to all present uh, on this webinar. So this morning we are talking about the changing rule of the unions. And you heard from both uh, ASG Desmond Chu as well as um, Associate Professor 
Irene Ng on how NQC has evolved over the years to tackle workforce changes, as well as on the global and local challenges in the area of work. I have themed my presentation, uh, Reshaping uh, the Future of Work, Agile Employers, Resilient Workforce. To set the context for my presentation, let me start by saying that the Singapore National Employers Federation is also a registered trade union, but in this instance, representing employers rather than workers. So, so even as NTUC is looking at workforce changes and evolving needs of the new workforce, we at SNEF are looking at the trends that are affecting the future of work and how through the agile employers and resilient workforce, we can emerge stronger together. Next, please. SNEF, being the employer representative, is the counterpart of NTUC. But our raison on that is closely tied to Singapore's system of tripartism. This is also clearly reflected in the first three words of our mission statement, to advance tripartism. Now, whilst representing employers, we want employers to implement responsible employment practices. Responsible employment practices and sustainable businesses go hand in hand. Next, please. Over the years, we have built strong tripartite relations that allow tripartite partners to strive for win-win-win outcomes. Broadly, in dealing with issues and challenges that employers are confronted with, SNEF will engage employers. We will seek to forge consensus among employers, even as we represent employers to seek and achieve tripartite consensus. Whilst negotiations are not always easy, we have been able to take into account the challenges that the various stakeholder groups face and find a way forward together. I believe that this has also been amply demonstrated over the course of the last three years dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, please. Just as uh, Brother Desmond uh, and Prof Irene had identified some of the challenges confronting workers, Employers and businesses are similarly facing challenges. We can group the trends affecting the future of work into the five Bs. While digitalization and tech transformation will accelerate the need for job redesign and skill development, employers' response will also need to take into account demographic changes and at the same time close the divides navigate increasing risk of geopolitical tensions and adapting to decarbonization. In fact, when thinking about response, it may be useful to think not in terms of a new normal, but rather a never normal uh, situation. In essence, reflecting the idea that it will be dynamic and ever-changing. As you had also mentioned in his uh, address earlier this morning about the, that the pace of change is relentless. This reinforces the importance for employers to be agile and our workforce to be resilient so as to navigate the VUCA environment successfully. Thus, I echo uh, ASG Desmond's point that tripartite partners will need to evolve our thinking and services to stay relevant. And that the role of the union, uh, in this case, both NTUC as well as SNEF, uh, within the construct of tripartism will be more critical than ever. Next. I would like to highlight uh, two recent examples of how we have worked together to address some of the challenges affecting both workers and employers. Perhaps the fact that AS, uh, ASG Desmond also mentioned these two examples is another demonstration of the close alignment and thinking that we have on the uh, challenges that we have to confront together. The first example is the PME task force. We do recognize that we will see an increasing proportion of our workforce comprising PMEs. And as a group, they do face specific challenges. SNEF had therefore worked together with NTUC to look into recommendations that will not only address the needs of the PMEs, but that will in turn meet the needs of the employers. Next, 
The second example is the tripartite work group on the low wage workers. This represents a concerted effort by all parties to support our low wage workers. I want to make the point that employers support the progressive wage model as it is not just about raising wages, but also productivity, skills, and career prospects. Increased productivity will enable employers to grant sustainable wage increases. Next. Earlier, I think Prof. Ng had mentioned about the expansion of the progressive wage model and her hope that we will extend it to more sectors. And of course, Brother Desmond also mentioned about where some of these sectors uh, will be implementing the PWM. So I will not go into the details, but I just want to add that our targets are ambitious. So SMEF and our tripartite partners, including the government of course, are also doing more to help employers and workers. So for example, the, the government will provide the progressive wage credits to help employers offset wage cost increase. NTUC, is supporting employers through their company training committee. SNEA administer the productivity solutions grant to help employers to redesign their jobs. And all parties are involved in helping to upskill the workforce. Next. Indeed, the need to focus on productivity is not only relevant in the context of the progressive wage model, but the entire workforce. Productivity, puts employers and workers on the same side. It allows employers to maintain cost competitiveness, even as workers experience a sustainable wage growth. Next, to conclude, employers will need to stay a job. They cannot remain static, but must respond to the changing environment to remain competitive. Through that process, they can bring their workers along. SNEF is working in partnership with NTUC to look at how we can better support employers and workers on this journey. The NTUC's company training committee, which was elaborated by both SecGen as well as Desmond earlier, is one of the ways that companies can do this. What we finally want to achieve is sustainable business that do translate to better outcomes for the workers too. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gingon. Uh, for your presentation and highlighting for us the shared goal of productivity for both employers and employees uh, to combine and increase the pie uh, so that there is a sustainable enterprise. And perhaps more so given the five Ds that you mentioned, um, digitalization, demographics, divides, etc. And it's, it is in this context of, of the, the challenges posed by the five Ds um, that, that I, I guess we have this uh, tension uh, that that uh, was raised by Irene earlier, uh, of you know between employment and and wage maximization, uh, with I guess the the view that employers are more interested in maximizing the former employment um, and uh, increasing the efficient employment of labor over wages, which is a cost and outgo. So maybe we'll again uh, come back to that uh, during the Q and A session. Um, uh, it's now time to open the floor. Um, but I will do the, the take the uh, opportunity to pose the first questions to each of the of the speakers. Um, and uh, my first question uh, follows on from what um, that you know something that that NTUC SecGen Mr. Ng Chi Meng mentioned earlier in the panel uh, that he had. He mentioned the need for the tripartite partners to move past the thirty thousand foot level and get closer to the ground. Oh, he said something like that anyway, I'm paraphrasing. So um, I, I guess if I may pose the first question uh, to Desmond along these lines, um, the question is, how does the labor movement, how does NTUC deal with concerns that it is too distant, removed from the specific challenges of workers, especially you know, given that workplaces have been disrupted by the five Ds that Kim Gwan mentioned? Um, thanks, Chris. Um, I think you are right on the mark um, that being distant from the ground or being perceived to be distant is something that uh, really drives us to work because the foundation of being able to provide good services and support requires us to be very much in touch 
with what the workers are feeling, what the workers need, and being able to marry that with the larger um, forces. And therefore, providing something that works um, for workers in the longer run. So we have about a million members. Um, I think that there are a couple of things that uh, we've been doing and we do hope to do better. One of it is to be able to understand our data better. Um, certainly we have enough members to be able to um, get a very regular uh, update on the different data coming through. I think there's something that we have a digital transformation program going over in NTUC that uh, is in the process now and we hope to be able to sharpen our work. The second one was how to be able to do something like every worker matter conversations, which we have now, and we are reaching out to 35,000 workers in a fairly deep fashion and to be able to do it consistently. And through that, to achieve two things, one, to engage in meaningful conversations with workers, letting them know that they are part of that co-creation process. It's no longer just listening. I think it's important that we involve them in creating solutions together. Um, you will find us going to policy workshops involving workers um, actually as soon as February, uh, very soon. And I think this is important because uh, like you say quite correctly, um, workers don't just want to feel that they're listened to but also that um, they have good views that we should uh, input into the policy process. And quite frankly, the complexity of the workforce requires us to tap widely on resources. Then the second thing is, um, as we go through these every worker matter conversations, very in-depth, then how do we engage our partners? For example, um, SNAF, uh, academia, uh, friends like Irene, and how do we make sense of all these findings regularly. I think that's critical. Um, as the next phase of growth for tripartism, we must be able to sense make a lot better. We must be able to listen a lot better and we must be able to co-create better. Um, so we see that as the next phase of what we will need to do uh, in order for us to build a good system that um, can react a lot better to the complexities of the workforce. Now, um, that being said, there's always been um, a little nagging feel that because we don't take to the streets or we don't have huge arguments with our employers, um, it means that all things are being settled. Um, Gim Guan would agree with me that um, today, I think we're the best of friends and we still are, but there will be many heated encounters that we have over, over details, you know, and um, both of us are equally right because we have to reflect the interest of our constituents. Uh, but that happens. Um, I don't think the country is better if we, um, if we have heated arguments that we can have no resolution with. But at the same time, I think we can have more people uh, to have insights into the process. Again, people to understand that uh, coming to a consensus at NWC is not so easy. Uh, I think certainly, I, I think that part uh, we can afford to have more people participate in, in that process, including the students, uh, to better see how uh, workforce dynamics are being worked out um, at the tripartite level. So we have two challenges. I think one, we need to sense make better, co-create better. And secondly, we need to let our people uh, have greater insights um, into how workforce issues are being dealt with, uh, sometimes rather difficult um, at the tripartite level. Thanks, Osman. And uh, maybe I can follow up uh, with a question actually from the floor already. Um, and if Irene and, and Gim Guan will, will bear with me, I'll again pose this uh, this question to Desmond. But um, feel free to incorporate some of um, you know the responses as well as the, you know part of the question uh, into your questions. Uh, sorry, your responses later on as well. Uh, and it's this. Um, it was posed um, anonymously, but um, it, it strikes to this idea of the independence of NTUC. Um, given our role, or sort of our tripartite uh, tri um, model, um, and you know, NTUC has a very close relationship with the employers, as you've already described, as well as the government. Um, so. Um, the, the, there is this reputation of, of, of Singapore as having a pro-business state um, and less 
um, concerned about worker welfare. Um, so, you know, maybe a response to that, um, you know, this this idea of, of you know, NTUC um, being independent, um, able to work for uh, the interests of the worker. Um, I think Chris, just uh, two quick reactions to that. Um, we have a million members and it's a fairly transparent process. Um, I think where members think that we are not being able to serve their interests, uh, members would leave us. And that's something that we are very cognizant of. And it's something that we monitor those very closely uh, because we do have certain trust that we're going to keep up. Um, and whether we can live up to our work for workers must be then reflected in whether workers are having a better life, better livelihood. Um, and those are things that we need to look at in the longer run. So what do I mean by that? Um, obviously, I think every worker will want us to advance interest um, to the fullest. But it's not always possible um, because of there's a fundamental principle. If we do not have good companies, we do not have good jobs, and we do not have good jobs, then there is no need for unions. So that kind of relationship is very real. Uh, but does that mean that um, by understanding that principle, we will, for, we will forego workers' rights? I think in this day whereby things are so transparent and work, uh, workplace issues uh, can be widely shared very easily, um, you'll find that there's a lot more transparency in the process and it's no longer people will vote uh, by walking out of companies and leaving uh, if companies are not living up to that. Um, so I think that independence in itself, uh, I think is manifested in the transparency that we have today. People can see. I think it has to be gauged by uh, our workers having good, stable jobs uh, with good career prospects over time. I think that's important. And of course, uh, whether NTUC is able to address workplace injustices uh, when it's brought to our attention or even uh, for more proactive stance. So um, I think from all uh, that three perspectives, I uh, hope to reassure, uh, of course, our, um, uh, um, our anonymous person <laughs> for the feedback um, that yes, it is an independent process. Uh, and you will find that and that is the reason why uh, even at NWC negotiations, it can become fairly tense. Uh, if you're not independent, then things will have cleared fairly quickly and I think Gim Guan would have uh, adhered to that, uh, would have attest to that as well. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thanks, Desmond. Um, maybe I'll com come on to Irene uh, and ask, um, you know, whether, again, following on from a, a point that you made earlier about uh, migrant workers not being represented, um, there are other groups of workers like the uh, low wage workers that uh, you mentioned that are perhaps not being that well served by established unions, not, not, not necessarily at the higher level, um, but I think, I think that that does happen quite well, uh, but more on the kind of the more informal type basis. So, um, you know, how, how might workers, especially those that are not well served by established unions, organize themselves? What help might they need from um, the, the tripartite? That's an interesting question, Chris, um, because I posed that question too, right? <laughs> About how they can organize. Um, and actually a lot of what you have been discussing, it speaks to me as a social worker because we wonder about such things too. Social as a profession, for example, we are supposed to be a voice on behalf of the vulnerable in society. But at the same time, we implement uh, programs that are um, from the policy makers. So we are mindful of the trade-offs at the macro level, but yet we have to be reminded to um, give voice to the vulnerable. And, and so I think there is a tension in a society like Singapore, where I think um, there is a lot of decisions and power in the decision-making that is among people in the elites that when we organize people maybe more in a self-organizing manner, um, I think there are hesitations, right? Um, besides from the workers themselves, but also from the professionals in how do we um, then collectively organize them. 
and and not um, get in too much trouble in a sense. Am I answering your question, Chris? Yeah, I think you're getting there, but but maybe you know if you can maybe uh, should we think about more um, sort of different ways of organization, not just your traditional union format, but are there different um, sort of models uh, that that could be developed, or actually maybe NTUC itself evolves to to incorporate some of these uh, new approaches. So maybe that's touching on what Desmond has already talked about, but you know I think there is this appreciation that there are still some workers that are not um, sort of well captured or not helped uh, as well as they could um, by the existing uh, organization structures. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can move on to Kim Guan and, and maybe pose that question, you know, what role uh, do employers play therefore in this in this process um, of, of, you know, helping um, themselves, but, but also their employees uh, in the in environment that, that you just described, right? The never normal. Um, so, so you know, uh, what what can employers do beyond you know, kind of participating in in, in all of the tripartite uh, initiatives that have already been um, described? So earlier, I did uh, mention the NQC CDC as an example uh, because if you think about it as a process, uh, companies do need to understand uh, what is happening within the environment what is happening within the sector that they're operating in. Uh, so government has uh, developed the industry transformation map to try to guide uh, businesses and employers in terms of where the business will head. And if they have, there is clarity about uh, the challenges that they have, uh, then uh, what government usually do is also then provide support in terms of grants that will allow the company to then adopt technology, improved uh, effectiveness, efficiency, productivity. Uh, concurrently, the company actually do need to look at uh, what would then be the impact on their workforce, uh, their existing workforce in particular. Uh, how do they, I make the point about how do they bring them along? What, what are the training gaps that the employers uh, will need to now um, try to address so that their workers are able to do the new jobs. So if I were to use a retail as an example, uh, what SNEF is currently doing is also working quite closely with the Singapore Retailers Association to look at the issues that are confronting retailers. Um, quite apart from the fact that they have a challenge in terms of uh, getting the manpower because we are currently faced with very tight manpower. Um, but that perhaps is also a, a, a catalyst, a impetus for them to look at how do they redesign the job so that, uh, you know, use technology so that the worker that are currently with them uh, will be better able to support uh, business growth as well as business success. And through the whole process, I think it is uh, therefore a, a situation where we will see both the business as well as the workers doing better. And we are actually working quite closely with NTUC to look at how the different initiatives, different grants, different uh, support measures that each of us uh, are able to bring onto the table, how we can bring all of that together to support employers, even as they embark on this journey. And this is a journey that they have to continually go on to because it doesn't stop. Sure. Uh, but I, I guess, um, would you... Um, concede that that you know at the end of the day, uh, and th and this is a follow on from uh, one of the questions that been posed um, in the in the Q and A panel uh, about this um, relative power between employers uh, and and workers. Um, that the employers have certainly much more um, you know, power than um, than workers. Their workers uh, in in terms of the um, the overall transformation process. So they have um, employers have a lot more agency, a lot more control over the process, uh, and there's this fear, I guess, from the employers employee standpoint that that um, they they will be sacrificed in the interest of of you know um, sustainability in the future, right? Um, so, what how would you respond to that? Okay, I would say uh, by uh, start by saying that actually the relationship between employers and employees is a symbiotic one. Uh, employers, uh, if they have no workers that want to work for them, uh, the employer will not be successful, right? But at the same time, if the employer and the business is not successful, the employees will not do better either. 
I think it is about how we can continually work together to ensure that both parties do better. The employer and the business do better, even as workers do better. So yes, it's true that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the employer is the one that employs the employees. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also quite clear today that employees themselves uh, do exercise agency in terms of which company they want to work for. Uh, increasingly, uh, you will also notice that, in fact, it's not a recent trend, right? Uh, employers are always looking at how can they better engage their employees. Because it's very clear that unless they have employees that engage with the company uh, and that they are able to attract and retain talent, uh, the company is not likely to do well on a sustained basis. So doing better, uh, implementing a responsible employment practices so that they can uh, attract and retain talent uh, is a business uh, uh, imperative. It is something that businesses understand and they do. Uh, they continue to try to do better. Uh, of course, our demographic change as well as the expectation of workforce continue to evolve as well. And so businesses also need to evolve alongside even as society evolves. So it is something that I don't think uh, it is necessarily a case that the, the employer exercise all the authority and power and that the employees themselves have got no agency. I, I don't think that is necessarily the correct way to look at this. Chris, can I respond to that as well? Yes, please. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, actually, I wonder, um, in terms of business transformation and industry 4.0, you know, Singapore is most highly ranked, for example, in terms of digitalization and how fast we've been um, changing, right? And this morning, like Jen talked about that, it's unrelentless, uh, it's, it's relentless, the pace of change. Whether we can afford to slow down a bit so that those at the bottom can catch up. Do we have to be so relentlessly fast? Yeah. Um, while I agree that in Singapore, we probably take into consideration the needs and voices of um, workers, but the most vulnerable at the, top, at, at the bottom, I think they're very far below and they might not even know what they're missing out on and they won't come out and speak, say, hey, come on, you know, um, help, let me catch up as well. So I, I wonder. Yeah, so again, it uh, strikes back to our, our just discussion just now, Irene, about, um, you know, kind of the, the relative um, or the groups that, that you know, will not be well represented. Uh, they might need that voice. And you know, maybe if I can, um, you know, just draw into the, the, the question, uh, one of the, or well, the discussion, one of the questions that was posed by uh, Professor Tan and Sir uh, to NTUC Sekjen uh, this morning, uh, but I think it's quite germane to our discussion right now. Uh, and and he asks this right really what is what are the specific outcomes that that the union movement um should be looking at right um in terms of you know um the kind of the overall goal what are the outcomes that um ntuc unions uh, should be looking at um and i'll actually pose to all through to, to all three of you please uh, if you can you know maybe have a think about that in, in your mind, maybe the, the most important outcome? Uh, Chris, maybe I, I, uh, I should take this first and uh, give Kim Guan and Irene some time to help us weigh on this. Um, I think firstly, uh, we, we cannot stray away from our call, which is for the future workforce and for future generation of Singaporeans. What kind of Singapore that we're going to have that we continue to create good jobs for them? I know it's a bit cliche, cliche when we say that, you know, this is standard government speak, but to, especially for the lower income and the lower middle income workers, it is vitally important that we're able to create a system that, um, that benefits them, that they can look forward to. Um, now, I think that's one. A specific outcome is can we continue to produce good jobs, good livelihoods for them, that really helps them to be able to enjoy economic gains from the country. Second one, I think a good outcome must be one that the new system must be one that is compassionate. That you're not left to fend for yourself when you fall out of the workforce 
for whatever reasons, and it could be those that are out of your control, but how we get you back up on the game. I think we can certainly help to reduce that kind of uncertainty. For example, um, in the event of the uh, of freelancers or gig workers, how can we reassure all gig workers, or in fact, our lower income workers, that every single one of them will have a basic retirement sum at, at, when they retire. If you put in a decent amount of work, you put a decent amount of time, we should be able to take care of you. I think that that is certainly very important to us. I think the third one is, can we allow more expression of um, uh, different uh, courses for our younger people? I think that is key. Um, yes, good jobs and good wages are certainly very important, um, but can our younger workforce feel, and not only just feel, but be able to participate in changing um, workforce policies? And I think that there are spaces whereby we can certainly allow them, perhaps even uh, through an AFA approach, to have more people involved in uh, our tripartite guidelines, for example. I think that is, that is definitely possible uh, for them to be part of the process. Because ultimately, we are building a system that not only addresses the needs of the current workers, but more importantly for younger workers, who is going to be um, the core of the workforce uh, within the next 10 to 20 years. So these will be the three things and uh, three outcomes that uh, I personally will look forward to um, as desired outcomes for uh, unions of the future. Thanks, Desmond. Um, Irene or Gengon, would you like to? I, I largely agree with Desmond, um, but I think for me, if I get more concrete and specific and think about the developments of unions globally, not just in Singapore, what unions are for, I see them as representing workers because workers would might not have the voice and um, the power to be able to negotiate better wages and, and job conditions. So I would say outcome would be more focused on those who lack representation and those who are um, being left out of the wealth of the nation. Kim Gon, uh, any um, sort of thoughts from the employer's perspective? Okay, so uh, in Singapore's context, uh, we have always mentioned that tripartism is our uh, open secret. Uh, it has allowed us to do well as a country. Uh, and also because as a country we do well, we are also able to help our people do better. So of course, one of the things about tripartism is the close working relationship that we continue to have. Notwithstanding that we may start off with different perspective and looking at issues quite differently, I think we, we all agree that it is important that uh, you know, to, we advance together, uh, not just the businesses, but also advance uh, the welfare of uh, workers. So tripartism doing better is something that I, I think is important. Then on our perspective, really, it is about how we continue to help our employers to implement responsible uh, employment practices. Uh, we believe that uh, you know, it is not necessarily uh, the best outcome if employers are only implementing practices because it is the law. The law requires you to do certain things. But it is good outcome if the employers are doing all the good things, regardless of whether there is a legislation. And better yet, if there is no legislation requiring it. But that it is something that uh, businesses believe they need to do. Uh, I, I, I think uh, Desmond will agree with me that really at the end of the day, uh, if the employers do better and through that process help the workers do better, actually both parties will do better. So by working together uh, and looking at the challenges and the trends affecting both employers, businesses, as well as workers, uh, you know, looking further ahead, I, I think that's a point that also Desmond made, uh, understanding what is coming before us. How do we support uh, both workers and employers so that we can deal with the challenges? I think I really made the point about, can we be less relentless? Uh? Uh, maybe two, two points to make is that uh, sometimes it is not whether we want to or we don't want to, uh, but that the environment around us is uh, compelling us to do something. If we don't do, uh, we may get ourselves into trouble. So, so there may be a need to do things so that we, we, we don't find ourselves falling behind, right? 
But I also agree that uh, if if we have to do things and we have uh, workers among us that are finding it difficult uh, to keep pace, then actually the question is what can the union do to better support the workers uh, and of course uh, employers as well. I think and government uh, as part of tripartism, we I think we can play different roles uh, that will allow us uh, to be able to support both the business even as they're transforming as well as workers that are impacted and affected by the changing uh, transformation. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. Um, now, maybe shift the tack a little bit. Um, and there are a couple of questions, uh, or actually three questions that, that relate to um, the definitions of, of lower skills, higher skills, and, and how uh, these um, different educational attainment levels are, are rewarded or um, recognized. Um, again, uh, an, uh, another question from uh, Prof Tan and Sir says that, you know, whether, uh, ask the question whether um, credentials should no longer be used um, to determine salary levels. Um, and uh, also another question from, um, I think it is, um, uh, Mr. J. Seelan Kalimusu, um, and talking about this, this uh, concerned that ITE graduates are not getting that wage premium that uh, they perhaps deserve with their additional um, education uh, that, that Irene was talking about earlier. So maybe, again, if I can uh, throw the, um, the the question open to all three of you uh, and, um, you know, uh, feel free to kind of just um, um, share your thoughts on, on, the, on that issue. Irene, do you want to go first or? Sure. Okay. I Oh, Mr. Sim, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so maybe a quick one. Huh? Um, I, I think it is useful for employers to continue to look at the paying according to the job role. So regardless of whether the what is the qualification that you have uh, in terms of paper qualification, I think the question is, uh, what can you bring to the job, right? Are you able to perform the job role? Uh, and how well are you performing job role? Of course, uh, it is not always the case that someone comes in being 100% fit for a job. Uh, then, of course, the employer will then do their part to train and upskill the worker so that the worker can uh, better perform their job. And of course, you know, um, over time, even better. And of course, the next step in terms of career progression. So uh, I would in general agree that uh, really we should try not to think of paper qualification as as the way to measure what is the wage that we need to be paying to a particular person or worker, but rather the job role and how well the individual is able to perform the role. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, so as I in my presentation, I think I was alluding to the fact that we should probably not um, remunerate based on just qualifications. Um, with regard to the ITE graduates, this is really challenging, right? Because we have really tried to improve the employability on and credentials for IT graduates, and yet we don't see the premium. And part of it is because they graduate, but they don't take on those jobs that an IT graduate should be taking after they have um, gone through the education. And I think it does come back down to wages. If the wages of those jobs are also um, Right, not that much better, right? Um, then, right, you have you might have a, a, a fantastic campus, some um, good curriculum, but if wages are still far off from the degree holders, then um, you know it's circular, it's circular. Then IT graduates will also then take jobs that don't need a ID certification. Um, so I I think we are trying very hard. There work study programs and internships. Uh, I, I do wonder how, how much those salaries are, how, how many, what proportion of IT graduates go into those programs. And I think it, it, we need to understand better that data as uh, what uh, Mr. Chu also mentioned about needing to understand the data to try and resolve this problem. Of the um, way Chris, yeah, Chris, can I just quickly weigh in a couple Please. of points? Um, I think first one, I, I really have to agree with uh, Prof's point on this. Because ultimately, it's about the wages. When you have better wages, the image of the job will improve. But there's no way you can improve the image of a job or the appreciation for the job if the wages don't move. Uh, ultimately, it becomes rather empty. It's saying that, you know, you're doing a great job, but I cannot pay you. 
and we should respect your profession, but we're not going to pay you. Um, I think that has got to change. Um, it's going to take some time uh, for us to do that because of the context whereby we develop over the years. I think that's one. The second one on the use of credentials. Um, I think we have to be quite careful because credentials, especially for the younger people, do matter. Um, especially for those fresh coming up from school or they are from the middle or lower income profile. The higher to higher income profile people tend to have more attachment opportunities, participating in different camps and stuff that they can show that I have credentials outside of my school. But for a lot of our uh, mainstream folks, it's going to be very difficult, especially from the lower income. You really only have an academic route. You can get on some attachment. I think we can do better on those. But those are important proxies for them to be able to get a foothold. Uh, especially when I start the career. And hopefully Singapore will evolve to a place whereby we place a bit less importance on academics and a lot more on uh, applied learning and experiences. But we cannot do away with credentials because in a, a marketplace, um, credentials are important for especially our uh, lower income people uh, to have some sort of a level playing field. If everything is just being left to experiences, I think uh, we might inadvertently harm them. I think there's a better equilibrium that can be struck, but we should be quite careful about doing away with credentials. Can I add to that? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. 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 It seems like we've uh, got this uh, theme of discussion that uh, we want to take on. Please go ahead. No, I like what Mr. Chu said. I think that's very true. So we, we are now refining what we are thinking, right? This is a conciliatory process here, <laughs> the tripartite system here. Um, so we're not talking about credentials don't matter. We're not pro proposing that credentials don't matter or they matter, but we, are, we don't use credentials as a barrier to um, promoting or increasing the salary of someone who's capable. Right? So yeah, so we can refine that suggestion that way, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chu. <laughs> I'm, I'm adding a slightly different perspective. So as you know, uh, Minister of Education, Minister Chan, has been uh, talking about this issue around school industry partnership under the Board Singapore conversation. Uh, and it's also true to say that uh, the industry move, uh, the school may not have necessarily caught up in terms of the curriculum. So if you acquire certain um, academic qualification, uh, what you have acquired may or may not be fit for purpose uh, in terms of the relevance. Uh, and so there needs to be a tighter uh, linkage uh, between what a person will acquire in terms of skills competency in the tertiary uh, institution and what industry requires. And the best way, or at least one of the good ways to do this, uh, would be to ensure that the industry is partnering the schools quite closely. Uh. And then, of course, providing opportunities for students uh, so that uh, you know, they, they can also see how the skills that they have acquired is applied. And I think that that, that translation uh, is, is quite a useful one. Um, so, so that's something that is ongoing. Uh, and I, I believe that we should be able to see something coming up from the ongoing conversation. Thank you. Um, again, staying with this idea um, and, and following on from a, a question that was posed in panel two uh, on Thursday last week. Uh, and um, it, it's, it's about um, you know, this, this concept of, of partnership and, and, and trying to upskill um, workers um, altogether. Um, the question is really, um, how can the government, private sector, um, the union movement work together to use disruptive tech to help workers uh, find new jobs or find new areas for uh, employment. So disruptive tech. Um, so we've talked about this this um, um, uh, you know idea of the partnership, but you know is there is there uh, the possibility that we use the tech that we now have, you know, uh, platforms that um, are around. Um, I, I've, you know, certainly NUS has uh, a platform uh, using uh, LinkedIn Learning to um, help us, um, you know, go um, and look for areas of, of new learning 
for all of the employees at NUS. Um, you know, could we extend that more broadly um, to to workers of all all, all stripes, um, gig workers including? Um, maybe I'll give a step. I I guess I I don't know enough about technology to know what disruptive tech <laughs> entails. Um, but in my other piece of research that's promoting universal digital access, we interviewed um, low income, low educated people who have um, challenges with technology and don't even own technology, and. Uh, we do see then there's an inequality because they don't even have the basics. And like what uh, Chris, you have alluded to that in NUS, we're training all our university graduates and even all our administrative staff in AI and, and all kinds of um, digital skills. So in the first place, I think um, we have to place the technology in the hands of the workers. Um, and uh, that includes both devices uh, and as well as the knowledge. And with knowledge, I, I think that we can maybe think about digital knowledge and education at the level of even now numeracy and literacy, not just going to the schools to teach kids, but teaching adults that don't have that knowledge now. And I wonder how we can roll out that kind of mass education um, so that the people without that um, knowledge basics, basic knowledge can at least have that level up in terms of digital knowledge. So uh, agree with uh, Rob Irene. Uh, of course, uh, you realize that uh, today I think the primary school kids are also getting a lot more digitally savvy. We talk about born digital, uh, digital natives. And of course, earlier I talked about one of the D's, a uh, divide, right? And a uh, digital divide is quite real. Uh, but notwithstanding, I think one of the things that I think we do believe in is that we need to look at how we can um, help our workers think about, um, I, I think Minister Manpower used the term career health, um, looking at their own career, like they look at the, their own physical health. Uh, and that there are things that you need to do to maintain your physical health Similarly, there are things that individuals need to do to maintain their career help, right? Uh, so government, uh, as you know, have got the skills uh, future credit, right? Uh, that all of us have access to. Uh, and I think it's important to be thinking about how do we use that resource that is provided to help us as individuals do better and look after our career help. Um, and, and if we are more deliberate about this, uh, I think we will have better outcome. So quite apart from uh, this skills future, um, together with MOM, SNEF also developed this toolkit called the Structure Career Planning Guide. And what this means is uh, we are encouraging employers to start having conversations uh, with their workers, um, you know, by the time they are 40s, uh, to think about what do they see as their career trajectory? Uh, and alongside that, uh, what are the steps that uh, both the employers as well as individuals may want to take so that they continue to uh, you know, move smoothly all, along that, that journey? Or at least uh, even if there are uh, shocks that come along the way that they are better prepared and more resilient uh, and better able to respond. So, so that's something that I think uh, is important for, for all, all of us uh, as individuals to be thinking about. Thanks, Kimberly. Alrighty, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. I have one more question that I'd like to ask. Um, and I think, I think this one, uh, I'll pose it first to Desmond, if, if Irene or Kim Kwan have uh, uh, comments, uh, uh, please chime in. Um, and, and it is quite specific, uh, and it is asking the question about NTUC's, NTUC's view about um, flexible work arrangements contributing uh, to uh, you know, more workers wanting to work, particularly women. Um, but with the pandemic now mostly over, um, employers are now requiring workers to go back to work. Um, and um, the, the, the question is whether um, how 
what is NTUC's view about this 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 trend? Desmond, you want to answer that? Yeah. Um. Thanks, Chris. Uh, first of all, I have flexible work arrangement. Um, there are a few definitions to it, and the scope is quite different. It is actually quite vitally important uh, for the workforce of the future, um, especially within Singapore's context. Um, why? Because we are going to have a sizable middle-aged middle-income population that is stretched with both um, ch child-caring uh, responsibilities and elder care. Um, caring responsibilities. If we do not tackle this, we will find that the middle-aged, middle-income group uh, will increasingly face more stress and being unable to cope, and in certain circumstances might even um, have to drop out of the workforce. So it's a vitally important concept uh, for us to do. And then the second thing is, I think there's a lot more scope to see flexible work arrangement as a um, only just something that is good to have, but really a strategic strength of any companies that is able to provide that to this workforce because there's just increasing demand for that. And a company that can position itself and best utilize its workforce, I think has a much better chance of succeeding uh, in that war for talent, which will not end uh, for the foreseeable future. Then the third one is, how far do we then push flexible work arrangement um, do we enter the realm of legislation? I think that is what uh, many people are looking at. Well, we certainly have uh, good tripartite guidelines to guide our work, um, but is there scope for us to look into things like caregiving leave, for example? I think that's important because um, as our population ages, we, we, we just don't have that many kids anymore. Uh, but we have our parents to take care of. And how do we adjust for that, allow our middle income, middle wage, or in fact, our middle aged workers to know that um, the system will adapt and work for you, right? And there are also some discussion on whether there should be a right to flexible work arrangement. I think that was discussed at various points. It's something that's certainly worthwhile looking into because it does foster um, deeper discussions and review a company's practices on, now, can, can we do something serious about this? Um, so I think that while we are still a bit of a distance away from legislation on this front, we certainly should give a lot more thought um, to things like caregiving leave um, to support up, to not only just a symbol, but really to support uh, the population better as a very noticeable way of evolving our flexible work arrangement system. And secondly, how do we develop things to become a strategic strength of companies um, rather than something that's good to have? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Desmond. Uh, Gimgon, would you like to respond to a, a something that, or anything that uh, Desmond said or uh, the question itself? Yeah, so I agree with uh, Brother Desmond that actually um, when companies implement flexible arrangement, uh, actually they are better able to try to and address the uh, needs of their employees. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think your earlier point, uh, they could even be able to access uh, the workforce that would otherwise have found it very difficult to work for the company. So yes, this is something that uh, SNEF, we are advocating uh, for companies to consider the different um, types of flexible arrangement uh, that are available that they can implement. Uh, perhaps some may not um, have done a lot, uh, but of course over the last uh, three years during COVID, because of the restriction, uh, self uh, workplace management measure, uh, actually many companies have also realized that in, in some of the uh, systems that they put in place have worked for them. Uh, but of course, some have also found it difficult and challenging. Uh, they have found that uh, you know uh, there are other issues that have surfaced. Uh, for example, uh, workplace culture, uh, team effectiveness, etc., may have suffered somewhat. So the question for them is then, you know, if they want to continue with existing practices, uh, what else do they need to do so that they are able to mitigate uh, some of the issues that they are seeing? Uh, and it is also true to say that the workforce expectation have also shifted. Uh, so if they don't move with the times, uh, they also find it increasingly difficult uh, to attract uh, talent to join their company. So, so there's something that I think company need to look at quite seriously. Uh, and of course, 
earlier point, right? I think uh, Desmond alluded to whether legislation, etc. And I, I think our point continue to be that, uh, you know, if, if companies on their own are able to do all the right uh, good practices, I think that is still the best outcome. And today there are guidelines that uh, have been promulgated that guides companies in terms of what they can consider, what they should do. So that's, that's the approach that we've taken uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have come to the end of our time uh, this morning, um, actually now afternoon. Um, uh, maybe um, I, I won't uh, summarize our discussion uh, today because I think this is part of the conversation that we'll have throughout the day. Um, the, the next session, will, which will start at 2 p.m., uh, is addressing job vulnerabilities, ensuring viable and decent work for all. And I think we'll continue some of these uh, discussions that we've talked about already in that section, uh, session later on at 2 p.m. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, here, uh, our panelists, Mr. Desmond Chu, Professor Irene Ng, um, and Mr. Sam Geng Guan, um, and all of you present online uh, for our discussion today. Um, and we look forward to um, seeing you in the session later on as well. Um, the video of today's session uh, will be available uh, on this online platform for about two weeks uh, if you'd like to watch this session again. But um, until um, 2 p.m., Thank you, and we'll see you later. Thank you.